Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, I didn't realize it, that, but it's actually very hard for me to see anyone from here. So <laughs> I'm actually half blind. I can't really see you. Okay, uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, I think it's going to be a hard act to follow after Aaron. He, he did a great talk just now. Uh, my name is Sao Xiong. And uh, let me start off by talking a bit about myself. So I come from Singapore. I think I'm probably the only Singaporean person here in the whole of Singapore, of uh, Ruby Cross India. Yes? At least in this room, yeah. Um, if you're not sure where Singapore is, actually this small little island at the end of the Mil Malay Peninsula. So that it's, uh, right now it's uh, getting a bit hazy at it, and my family's there, so I'm a bit worried. But uh, yeah, that's Singapore. I work in HP. Um, but I don't work in the traditional HP um, business unit that everyone knows about. I work in an organization called HP Labs, which is basically the research function of HP. It's a corporate research function. And the kind of work that I do there um, involves cloud computing, big data, and mobility. It's kind of a high-level sounding thing because a lot of the things that we do actually are um, a bit secret. Yeah, so I'm not really supposed to talk too much about it. You have to sign NDA actually to for me to actually talk about it. So obviously, what I'm going to talk about today has nothing to do with cloud computing, big data, or mobility. <laughs> what I'm going to talk about today is um, a passion of mine, um, Ruby. I've been doing Ruby since 2005. That's a number of years, and uh, and I think it, I've been very fortunate to actually stumble upon Ruby after Java. I spent about uh, uh, 11 years in Java, and then I stumbled upon Ruby. Um, I love Ruby so much, I actually wrote um, a couple of books on it. I, I wrote three books, in fact. The first one is on Rails. Uh, second one's on Sinatra. Anyone here uses Sinatra? Uh, great, yeah. It's, it's my favorite uh, at this point in time. I actually do not use Rails anymore. Yeah. Um, and the last one I used was, the uh, last one I wrote, oh, it's not supposed to be blue, actually. It's supposed to be purple, but uh, yeah. So it's Exploring Everyday Things in R and Ruby. That was published last year. And uh, this year, last month, it was translated into Japanese. And then I realized it was also translated into Chinese. So yeah, so it was. Thank you. <laughs> the last one, the Chinese one, was especially important for me. Because now I can go back to my parents and say, hey, I'm a published author. Yeah. <laughs> Before that, they said, what? I can't understand a single word you, you write. Yeah. So it was kind of difficult. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today, it's a, a gem I wrote, it's called Muse. Um, it's basically about writing music in Ruby. It's a pure Ruby domain specific language for synthesizing music. I call it synthesizing music because a lot of uh, gems out there um, right now, the, the Ruby gems, actually create music through MIDI files. So if you are involved in, in music production in any sort, you know, most of the time people actually use MIDI files to generate uh, the music. Uh, but that's not what I do here, and I'll show you what I mean later on. Um, by the way, just a quick show of hands, and I'll, I'll have to do this. Um, how many of you actually do anything with music? Play music, you know, music scores. Well, that's good, it's good, it's good. Yeah. I hope you enjoy this, because um, I actually enjoy myself tremendously doing this. Okay, anyone recognize this picture? Sorry? Uh, no, no. So I think you recognize this, su this song, though. Uh, let me turn up the volume. What I'm going to show you today, it's um, how I actually created uh, something like this. Uh, let me show you. 
So this was actually generated. That was just a snippet. That wasn't the entire song. Um, and this is actually not the entire song either. So basically, I converted from a, uh, a score that's written in Muse that creates Hotel California, right? And this is how it looks like. I'll show you more about it. Uh, I'll show you more of it later on. So um, what I'm going to talk about in the next 40 minutes or so is about how I created music, uh, created Muse. So I created Muse from first pr principles. Basically, I first I created the sound from sine wave. So I generate the sine wave and create sound from sine wave. Then I organize the sound into music notes. After that, I write the notes to a file and I wrap it up finally with a Ruby DSL. Right. So that's that's what I do. I explain. Okay, let's start. Um, so the next few slides will be a little bit boring, um, but bear with me, uh, there's something good at the end of it. So about sound. So sound is produced by vibration of something. It could be air, it could be water, it could be anything. And this vibration produces waves. And the two properties of sound waves are um, amplitude and frequency. And this is, this is actually important, yeah? yeah. Um, you have the amplitude and then you have the frequency. So both, are the prop both properties are important as I'll show later on. Um, the sound is created, the uh, sine wave creates a pure sound. If you actually want some other different type of sound, say you want a human voice, you want music, you actually have to combi combine these sine waves together and this will generate all kinds of sound. Um, for digital sound though, then you have to take the sine waves and store it into a uh, digital format, right? Basically into sound file. Now that's sound, but how do we actually generate music out of it? Um, music is nothing more than organized sound, right? And um, uh, music notes are specifically sounds with specific pitches, which is frequency and duration. And uh, each note that you hear corresponds to a particular frequency in, in hertz. The scale that I'll be using today, it's um, the chromatic scale, right? This is a very common com uh, scale that you will see. It's basically a sequence of 12 notes. And uh, these are the 12 notes. So if anyone actually plays the piano or keyboard, this is, is really, really familiar. So it's, um, it, there's an octave of 12 semitones ranging from a C to a C. And the progression from one note to the next note is from C to C sharp. Uh, that's one semitone. That's 12 semitones altogether. Okay. There is actually a lot of science behind music. Um, and the frequencies for the notes are actually related in a mathematical formula. And they all follow, if we actually use certain um, um, mathematical formula, the standard pitch is A4, which is 440 hertz. There's actually an ISO standard for this, uh, in case you're not familiar. I was actually quite astounded when I first saw this. Um, notes of the same pitch are in the ratio of the power of two. So for example, if it's one, if it's a two, four, eight, and then it goes half, quarter, and so on and so forth. This is what I mean um, in a visual form. From A4 is 440 hertz. If you go up higher, A5, there will be 880 hertz, and so on and so forth, right? And of course, if you go down, it becomes longer wave, and then it's 220 hertz, and so on. Now, what I mentioned earlier on is that um, the note between the 12 semitones between one octave, it's um, 2F, right? So two times the frequency from 440 hertz to 888 hertz. That's one octave, which is 12 semitones. What about between one semitone, between two semitones? From C, say C to C sharp, that's one semitone. So the, there is a specific formula, it is two to the power of one over 12 times the frequency, okay? And I think that's basically all the formula that you need, right? This is the, the only formula you need. If you want to get a, a uh, frequency of a note starting from A4, if you want to go to the next one, say for example, you want to go to uh, C5, um, that's three semitones further down. You go and multiply it by two to the power of three over 12. Uh, with the 440 hertz, you get the frequency of C5, right? So you can get very quickly, basically all the semitones that you want. Okay, um, so now we know how to generate the musical notes. We have to generate the actual sign which we represent it. So we have a simple formula. Um, the sine wave is generated by sine 2 pi f, f being the frequency that we found out earlier, 
and two pi is basically we, um, we need to represent it in radians, okay? When you apply this formula, what you will get is a basically a series of uh, points, right? You get a, a sine wave, and uh, if you want to get the, um, the information, you sample the sine wave. You sample a sine wave at particular points on the wave, and for the uh, musical sound, you have uh, 44,100 samples over a period of one second, right? So sometimes you hear 44.1K, that basically that's what it means, right? There are 44,100 samples within one second. So what we do is we take sample at every one of these, um, and that's the code of uh, that's the code I use to, to get this. Um, it's a pretty simple code. I won't really need to go through it. And this is what you get in the end. In the end, you get a stream of data, okay, um, which is a, a huge array with a lot of uh, uh, arrays in it. So the array basically has two values. Um, any guesses why there are two values? Ah, yes. The gentleman in red is right. It's uh, stereo, basically. Right one is the left channel, one is the right channel. It's stereo. Okay. So this is what you get. No, this is not what you get, sorry. Yeah. Uh, technical difficulty again. Okay. Sorry, you're going to hear a very loud sound during this. Okay. Do you hear it? Okay. So this is what you get. Let me try that again, yeah? not coming out. Sorry. You hear that? Yeah, so that's the sound you get from the sine wave. Yeah. So if you can just keep it on, I think you turn it off this time? Yeah. You can just keep it on, yeah. Because there will be more coming in. So, yeah. so now we can produce a musical note. Well, of course, a single musical note is pretty boring as you hear just now. So what we want is uh, basically more variety in the sound, right? So two concepts that I'm going to talk about is harmonic and the envelope. So harmonic, um, if you actually have just a sine wave, it produces what they call a fundamental frequency, which is basically the pure sound that comes out from a sine wave. If you want to produce more interesting sounds, you have to add other sound, uh, other waves to it, okay? Uh, especially if you add a sine wave with a different multiples of the same frequency, it does not change the pitch of the musical note, but it does change the quality of the sound, right? So this is what I mean. It's, it's really poor out there, uh, but you can catch my slides later on. So basically I have two waves, and when I add them up together, it becomes a single wave, which is a very squiggly wave. Okay, so what I did here is uh, I added y equals sine x with y equals um, sine x, Sorry, y equals sine x with y equals sine plus uh, sine two x. So when you add up these two waves together, you get a very squiggly line. This is much clearer, and this is what you hear. Can you tell the difference? Okay, you can't tell too much of the difference. But let me try this again. Yeah. So this is the pure sine wave. This is the one with harmonic, right? So there's a difference now. But of course, if it's just pure monotonous sound, it's pretty boring. So if you change the amplitude, and this is why I said frequency amplitudes are important, uh, if you change the volume of the notes over time, which is basically changing the, the amplitude, um, and also the duration, uh, it will change the, the quality of the sound as well. So I have two examples here. One of it, I apply an envelope of uh, sine of the duration, and you get the first one. And then the second one, I apply the cosine of the duration, right? So this is how it sounds like. This is the first note, the sine of the duration. And this is the second one, right? Can you tell the difference? First, we'll slowly increase the volume and then taper off. The second, we start with a loud, then slowly goes down, right? So these are the two different sounds. Okay, so we got all that we need now. What we need now is just to dump it into the sound file. Right, because what we have generated so far are just array. We have just data. What we need to actually do is put it into sound, sound file. And the sound file format that I'm using is a WAV file. It's a very fundamental uh, sound file uh, format, um, which is a uncompressed um, format called PCM, the pulse code modulation. Right. There are two formats, basically WAV and AIS. 
Uh, they're very popular, but the one I'm using is, is Wave. Okay. Um, but what I'm doing here is basically nothing more than a representation of the analog signal. So the sine wave comes out in um, numbers, and these numbers are pumped into the wave, wave file. You'll see in a short while. Okay, so what is a wave file? A wave file is basically a RIF format. Uh, it's a bit stream format stored in chunks. It's a linear PCM encoded, two channels of 44.1K uh, samples a second, 16 bits per sample. Right, so six um, then this is how it looks like internally. You have the RIF file format right at the top, and then in the middle you have a format chunk, which basically tells it what's the audio format, a number of channels, um, the byte weight, and so on and so forth. Uh, the data chunk is where all the data is. Okay. Um, you will look at the bottom again, you have two channels, one and two, right? And as I mentioned earlier on, if one and two is because that is in stereo. Okay, so if you open up a wave file, this is actually exactly what you see, right? You open it in a hex editor, you this is what you see. You will see the chunks, and this is basically all, all in uh, binary, right? These are just numbers that you stuck into the uh, uh, wave file. And now how do I actually create a wave file in, in Ruby? Um, there's, again, many ways, or you could um, write it manually using array, dot array pack, or you can and read it manually again using string unpack, because that's a bit tedious. Um, there is a library called bin data. It's actually very useful if you want to write binary data. And this is the, the library I use. Right, so uh, bin data. Uh, basically, I define all of these uh, um, formats. So this is the format. I converted this format using bin data like this. And um, I create a WAV file. I set some default formats. And in the end, this is how I use it. So there's a wave file, wave.new, the name of the file, and then I write the stream. The stream here is basically the large array that I showed you uh, earlier on. And then uh, once you close the file, you have a wave, you have a wave file, and that's a sound file. Okay, so that's all you have for creating actual sound um, musical notes. And putting it all together, uh, this is what you get. Right here is getting the frequency getting a sample, the duration, the stream, um, sapping through the sine wave that's been created and writing in the stream. Here you see the two axes, basically um, stereo sound, but the left channel and the right channel is exactly the same. Of course, I could actually create the left channel and right channel to be something different, but uh, that would look quite awkward. So I, I just didn't, I didn't do that. Now, now we could actually create a sound and create a musical note. Let's wrap it up in a domain-specific language. So anyone here knows what DSL is? Yeah. So I think a room full of Rubyists, right? Can't not know what DSL is. Yeah. So <laughs> um, yeah, so design for specific domain, captures concept of domain, including jargon. But the amazing thing is still a Ruby program. Yeah. So the techniques um, in creating DSLs are pretty simple, actually. Um, quite standard. And these are the three standard ones I use. Um, the first one is the method, the whole domain specific language is basically a method, uh, between method in the two classes I have, which is song and bar. And then I use instance eval to evaluate the uh, music source. And finally I use method listing to catch the names of the notes and chords, right? Um, which is not just the notes, it's also chords. Uh, you'll see in a short while. So the uh, DSL are basically methods. I have a class called song. And this is how it translates to song.record Hotel California, setting some parameters, uh, bits per minute, and then I set the bar. So bar here, uh, passing in a block, a Y block. So you notice here D4, D4 is the note D4 um, with a par parameter. So D4 is actually a, a method, right? So I'm actually passing methods in. Instance eval. So I'm basically evaluating the, the method. And finally, method listing. So I could, of course, uh, set all the uh, notes. There are only really a finite number of notes. Like say, I just want to set the number of notes in the piano, right? just 88 keys, that's, that's about it. But what about chords? So chords are basically combinations, right? So it's impossible for me to define everything. So I use uh, method listing. And that generates the uh, uh, necessary sound. 
Okay, so that's it about the DSL. Let me show you the Turkish mark. Anyone familiar with the Turkish mark here? Anyone classically trained? No? Okay. So this is the Turkish mark. Rondo Allah Tuta. I didn't actually recreate the entire song, right? And uh, that would take me too long. I basically recreated the first nine bars. So what I've done is I've represented this in code in the uh, Ruby DSL. This is it. It's for Mozart. So song dot record Turkish march. I set a default envelope. The harmonic is supposed to be organ, right? Actually, the harmonics are not perfected, so you know it's just something. Um, the first bar, bar number one, beat is quarter notes. So B four A four G sharp. So G I S I S is basically the um, it's a notation, right? So I think for those who who know music, you know what G sharp is. But GIS is the actual notation. Uh, in some different languages, they use GIS and A4. So if you look at the musical notes here, basically B, B, B4, A4, B4, A4, G sharp 4, and A4. Right? It's basically a representation. And this, you would, this is how you actually write the whole song. This goes on. So bar 2 actually have left hand and right hand, right, you have left hand and right hand, so I just write two bars, right, and I call them with the same name, uh, same number, right, uh, so, of course, if it's a full orchestra and uh, within that same bar, you have 10 instruments, right, then you would have uh, 10 different bars to follow the same numbers, theoretically, it should work, although I have not actually done that yet, okay, so this is what you see, and uh, this should be what you should hear. Let me try to get that up. Okay. Thank you. So this is the Turkish march in Muse, but there's more, okay? So what I want to introduce you next is uh, what I call also the algorithmic composer, okay? Um, so what's algorithmic composition? It's not something I made up, okay? This is actually a, a real definition from Wikipedia, okay? <laughs> it's uh, a technique of creating, uh, of using algorithms to create music, right? So you have a computer program that can, you can use to actually write music. So why not actually get the computer itself to write the music for you, right? That's the next natural progression, right? And uh, totally cutting out the human in the equation. No, not really. You know. <laughs> so this is what I'm going to do. Um, you grab a tweet from Twitter and then create music from it, okay? Of course, you can also scan a picture, uh, get today's weather, you know, whatever you want, right? Basically data, and then after that, you take the data, massage it, do whatever you want, and generate music from it. And this is what I'm going to show you. The algorithm. Okay? Algorithm is very simple. Um, basically, it's melody, and it's chords, and then you get the music. And I'm going to show you how I, I generate this using Muse. So first, I grab a tweet from the Twitter. Very simple. Um, I'm going to try to show it to you live after this. Um, getting the uh, RubyConf India hashtag. I get a tweet and split it up into words. And I convert each word into, num uh, into a number using the touchstone keypad algorithm. Sounds very sophisticated, right? And if you want to know what the touchstone keypad algorithm is, very complex algorithm. Anyone? No? <laughs> okay, it's just it's very simple, right? So um, A, B, C is two, D, E, F is three, and so on. Um, very simple conversion. I create, it, I generate a number out of it, and I find the seven most frequently found notes in that particular tweet. Okay, 
And from that, I determined the musical scale. Okay, I'm us only using a major scale here. So for anyone who's trained in, in music, you, you know there are so many scales, but I'm just using the major scale. Um, I determined the seven most frequently used notes and I determined how many sharps there are. Okay, the number of sharps will then tell me which scale it is in. Okay, of course this is totally arbitrary, right? It's something totally made up by me. You can actually write your own algorithm, it's just something that I made up. And then I use a chord progression. Now I get a scale, I use a chord, chord progression. It's very simple chord progression, it's one, four, five, one, four, five. And I keep doing it, one, four, five, one, four, five. And there you have it, I have the chord, right? So next thing is the melody. What I do is I start with the first note of the scale. So I determine what scale it is, I use the first note of the scale. And then I calculate the distance between the current note and the next note. And also the direction, whether it's the note is going up or it's going down. And then from the, um, the word, I calculate the number of, uh, calculate, I find the number of syllables and each syllable represents one beat. Then I, I know the number of beats to, to use. And then of course I move from one note to the next note. So from next note, I determine again, uh, is it going up, going down, and how many there are. Okay, from that to the end of the tweet, I would have a melody. So I have a melody and I have chords. And then I take all the, uh, the entire tweet and I uh, break it out into chunks of four words and uh, use four words per bar and then I write it into a wave file using MUSE. Okay, so very quickly, this is basically what it is. Um, it's pretty robust, but uh, let me just cut to the chase and just show you the code. So this is also. Okay, this is this is the code. They actually changed um, the algorithm. Uh, sorry, they changed the API. So I actually had to fiddle around with it this morning. Um, and composition, and finally generate the um, the music. So here goes. not very fast, so it takes about uh, one and one and a half minutes. Oh, it's actually a lot shorter already. Okay, so this is basically the text. Thank you, whoever it is. Okay, <laughs> to the scale of A major, and then it's recording the music called autobot.music. Okay, it's generating files in, um, in parallel, basically. Um, so if we actually have a long piece of music, it's a lot faster. Basically, I split up the work in, in a parallel file. Uh, this is what you get. So this is the tweet from uh, whoever it is. This is the song. That's it. Thank you for listening. Check uh, We'll take some questions. Anyone? Um, hi, great talk. Okay. I'm actually from a telecom um, background, so I was I really liked it. Um, I have two questions. So the first question is: I understand that you are generating some values, sign values. How exactly does it uh, get converted from um, electronic energy to sound energy? What software do you use? Uh, sorry, it's, I'm not trying to be snide here. It's, it's called Ruby. No, I know. <laughs> No, wh wh I want to see the code. Oh, ah, okay. Um, yeah, um, yeah, sorry. I, I, that was mean, actually, sorry. <laughs> it, you, you can actually get to GitHub, you can see the, the whole thing. Um, basically, I generate a, a um, basically I generate a, a sine wave. From the sine wave, I take the, um, 
samples from each point. Um, not sure how to, to explain this better. So I feed a set of numbers to it into the equation. The equation generates a number, right? So I generate this number two times, or rather I take this number and then I put it into an array. And that becomes a sine wave, right? Because a sine wave here basically is a, um, a series of numbers that increases and then decreases and then increases and decreases. And that's all there is to it. Is that clear? Yeah. If not, I can, you can look for me and I, I promise not to be so mean. Uh, yeah. Hey, here, here. Um, I know that uh, the tweet was fairly small and that um, the kind of characters you get in, in the words gonna be really random. How did you manage to make something that comes out of it sound good? Like what part of it, I didn't get it. Like was it the touchstone algorithm that made it? Uh, okay, so uh, this is actually part of music theory. Um, so that's the reason why I actually got the, the scale, right? So any, any notes within the scale, if you play them together, they actually sound pretty okay. I mean, it's not fantastic music, but if you play a certain scale in a certain way, um, it will actually sound good. It will sound good naturally. It's part of uh, music theory. So it's not because of my algorithm. Um, so, okay, let me try to go to the slides again. Okay, so this is, this is the algorithm. Basically, I find the seven most frequently used notes, right? So I have seven notes. These are the notes that are most frequently uh, found because I, I could found in the tweet, right? So the, the tweet generates a number of words and each word is a representation of a note, right? So each word is actually a note, yeah? Um, these notes, if I have, say, uh, 140 words, uh, 140 words, Maybe I have 20 words, right, within this tweet. So I have 20 notes. But these notes could be repeated. But I find the seven most frequently used notes. And from these notes, I find the scale of that particular tweet, right, these seven notes. Using a very common method, I find a number of uh, sharps within these seven notes. And then from that number of sharps, I determine which scale it is. And that will determine which scale I'll use to generate the melody. And also the, uh, the chords. If I play the chords in a certain way in a one, three, uh, one, what's it, one, four, five progression, it will sound good. Like um, it will sound, oh, it won't sound good. It will sound okay. It won't sound really horrible. It will sound okay. Um, this is one method I use. You could, of course, use any method you want, right? You could really make some really, really weird music if you want to. Uh, and I, of course, I use the chromatic scale only, right? Um, I don't know what scale um, Indian music you use. You could actually generate that as well. Uh, no, we are sorry. We are out of time. So um, you can actually definitely grab hold of him. Uh, yeah, come and ask me um, after this. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.